upon other animals. Their job is to be a predator, a hunter at the top of the food chain. <coughs> now, that happens to be probably the most important job in the wild, in my opinion, because they basically control the health of the environment by doing two very important things. Number one, they catch and eat the weak and the sick. If there's an animal out there in any part of the environment running around with an illness or a disease, it can spread it through the population. The job of the predator is to single out the weak and the sick, and their immune system, for the most part, protects them from that illness, so they can catch that animal and eat it without becoming sick themselves. So by removing that animal from that group and from the surrounding environment, they stop it from spreading disease. That allows all the strong and healthy to survive. So although they're preying on an individual within a group, they're keeping the group healthier as a whole by doing so. And in nature, the group, the big picture, so to speak, is always more important than the individual. They also control the numbers of all the animals, keeping those groups or populations in proper balance to one another. We've all heard that old saying, the balance of nature. The balance of nature is, in the most part, controlled by predators. And it doesn't matter what type we're talking about. Out in the ocean, sharks, killer whales, all kinds of fish that prey upon other fish on land, lions, tigers, wolves, bears, right down to predatory insects and predatory plants, believe it or not. Birds of prey, hunters of the sky, very simple, doing the same important job. There are hundreds upon hundreds of different types or species found all around the world. They come in a great variety of shape and size and color from very small to large and powerful. You will see a variety here in the next hour. A couple of the species live right here in this area. You might see them on any given day or night. Others come from rather far away places around the world. So it's kind of a rare chance to see some of those up close. To do their job, to survive out there, although they may look very different and live in different areas and catch different prey, they have the following tools and skills in common. All have powerful feet and sharp claws called talons for catching the prey. A sharp hook beak for tearing that prey apart once it's caught. And very powerful eyesight for spotting that prey far away. Often called binocular vision for that reason. Their vision is said to be eight to ten times more powerful than ours. So basically a good way to look at it is that when you look at the bird, keep in mind that every little detail about that bird helps it survive in some way. That basically goes for any animal. Everything in nature serves a purpose, even if we don't know what that purpose is. Okay, we're going to start out with some owls. We're going to start out small and we'll work our way up the side. I'm going to take a little walk around with each bird. Um, keep in mind, I will, will not stop to answer questions during the program. I've got a lot of information to share with you and quite a few birds to show you. And I want to make sure we get through the whole program. So I don't want to slow us down by answering questions during, but I'll be happy to do that after the program as I pack up. So this little character is a screech owl. Yeah. Well, are one of our more common North American owls found from coast to coast here in the U.S. And names can be a little deceiving. They don't actually screech. They make, they make quite a beautiful flute-like whistling noise. And when people see this little bird, they often naturally assume that it's a baby and it's going to get larger, it's going to grow bigger. But that's not the case. It's a full-grown owl. Smaller species of owl. Keep in mind, their job is to tackle all kinds and all sizes of prey out there, from the smallest to the largest. So, small birds catch small prey, larger birds catch larger prey. They're limited in what they can catch by their size and strength and speed and so forth. They're all opportunists. They will take any opportunity to catch anything they can for a meal, but they tend to focus on certain types of prey in certain areas. The main prey of a small bird like this is going to be anything from bugs to mice. Insects, crickets, grasshoppers, hopping, hopping around on the ground, maybe a, a moth flying around out there at night. Mice, meadow voles, occasionally a small bird or a small snake or a lizard. Again, an opportunity. Catherine being so small, being so small, this little character needs every advantage possible. He eats a wide variety of prey to find. Now we all know that owls are nocturnal, but because they are nocturnal, they are often misunderstood. There's a lot of old, long-standing myths and legends and so forth about owls. 
things that I hear on a daily basis that are not true. A couple of examples. Okay, here's one. Because owls are nocturnal and they come out at night that they can't see during the day. Bright sun hurts their eyes. They have to sleep all day. They can only come out at night. None of that is true, actually. Owls have incredible eyesight, far better than ours, even on a bright sunny day. The thing that makes an owl's eyes different from the other birds, and certainly from ours, is that they have an incredible ability to see really well, really clearly, in low light or dim light. Their eyes are much more efficient than ours are. We walk around at night and obviously we can't see very well. Our eyes need a lot of light to see clearly. The brighter it is, the better we see. But an owl just needs a tiny bit of moonlight or starlight. And their eyes kind of act like night vision goggles. They can magnify that tiny bit of light. It clears up their sight picture. So they see much better than we do. Normally I handle the birds with a glove but he's so small and so delicate when he sits on the glove, I don't even realize he's there. I have much better control when I have him on the bare hand. You'll see me when I handle the birds, all the birds have soft leather or nylon straps called jesses around their ankles, they fit comfortably around the ankles, so I can control the bird when he's sitting on the glove or attached to a leash or so forth. There are two colors of screech owls here in our country, gray and red, this is a red screech owl. Well camouflaged for surviving in the forest. And because he's small, he's got natural enemies and other birds of prey as well. Keep in mind, birds of prey are not social creatures. They don't pal around and hang out together in the wild. They will prey upon one another. A larger hawk during the day make a meal out of this bird. So his greatest chance of survival is hiding out during the day. Coming out at night when he is in his element. And he's got good color for that. Little bird like this, sit right up against the trunk of a tree, close those brightly colored eyes. And he's even got a couple little tufts of feathers. We typically call them horns on top of his head. He can lay them down flat and make them disappear. He can see them straight up on top of his head. If you were sitting in a tree and he closed his eyes, he would see those little tufts of feathers straight up because he wants them to look like little twigs or tree branches, like sticks, so he looks like part of the tree. One of the concepts of camouflage is not only blending in in color, but looking like the background, breaking up your shape so you look like something you're not. And he's behaving rather well. He tends to be a little paranoid. He's doing fairly well. He's adjusting. They all learn by repetition and exposure. Keep in mind, birds of prey are very primitive-minded creatures. I always say that they're instinctive, not intellectual. So they learn lessons slowly. They have to be exposed to things over and over again. So here we have a barn owl. Now barn owls, barn owls get their name for where they've been known to nest and live on occasion in an old barn or a building. Now that's not a normal or a natural place for a barn owl to nest, or any other owl for that, for that matter. But they're actually cavity nesters a lot of owls are cavity nesters. Screech owls will do that, barn owls will do that as well. So they're not actually building anything. They're just nesting in a hole in a tree. There's a big old dead tree or a broken off trunk or a branch with a hole in it and there's a hollow there. That's a nice dark safe place for them to lay their eggs, raise their young, offers them protection from ground predators. So because that, they're not actually building anything. It's not really complicated. They're, they're more able to adapt and nest in a variety of places. And one of the things they've started to do somewhere long ago is they've picked up on the fact that they can nest in an old barn or a building where their favorite prey is found. And we're going to go to mice now. Mice is the number one favorite prey of the barn owl. Mice and meadow voles. Although he's larger than the screech owl, he's actually a very delicate bird as well. Anything bigger than a rat would be too much for a barn owl to tackle for the most part, on average. So if there's an old barn out in a, on a farm or in a field that's left unattended or, or attracting these rodents, the, all the owls are doing is adapting. They're adjusting their lives and they're following a food source. Even a building in the inner city that's got rodents may have barn owls controlling the area or living in the building. And as I walk around, you know, the bird is naturally facing me on the glove. You notice he can spin his head around when he wants to and look directly at you. They have a very flexible neck. 
And that's really practical when they're hunting. Everything about the bird is practical. Always remember that, even if you can't figure out a certain detail. It usually goes back to survival and hunting in some way. And with that flexible neck, it just allows them to scan quickly and easily in all directions. Typically a bird like this is moving from tree to tree out there at dawn or dusk or throughout the night and he's searching the ground below for rodents. So, you know, if you were up in the top of that tree looking down, you'd have to constantly be changing position, moving around in all directions to be able to see because we can only turn our head a couple of degrees to either side. But a bird like this can sit perfectly still, not move a muscle and turn just that head and look in all directions. They don't want to be seen or heard by the prey that they're hunting. If they're seen or heard, the prey is more likely to escape underground and make their job that much more difficult. So the element of surprise is important for their ability to catch the prey. But actually one of the things that sets the owls apart even more than anything else from the other birds of prey is their incredible hearing. Daytime birds of prey are very visually oriented creatures, but the nighttime birds, the owls, are very sound oriented. One thing you'll notice about all the owls, no matter how different they look, in size, shape, color, whatever it may be, is that rounded face that they have. And that's one of the reasons that they can hear as well as they do, the shape of their face. It's designed to catch sound. When he looks at you for a moment, what you're seeing are thousands of tiny feathers and layers, very fine hair-like feathers around the eyes, those big circles, discs of feathers, they call them. And right behind them on the sides are his ears. His ears are very large, even larger than the eyes, but you can't see them because they're hidden in all those feathers. Basically where ours are on the head. But the big difference is that there are big holes in the head and they point in different directions. In other words, on one side, one ear points down toward the ground. On the other side, one points up toward the sky. So when he's looking down, he's listening for the movement of the prey on the ground. And when something like a mouse is running around in the grass and the leaves, that tiny sound travels all the way up to that owl on a quiet night. The shape of his face catches that sound and funnels it or directs it into his ears. The face acts like a satellite dish catching an incoming signal. All the feathers directed into the ears. Now, because his ears are pointed in different directions, he's going to hear the sound differently than we would. He's going to have separation. He's going to hear it louder and clearer in one ear than the other. In other words, if we were sitting here and somebody yelled to you from over in the direction of the barn, you'd hear it coming from that general direction. The owl would hear very specifically where it was coming from. They bob their head side to side and up and down in a funny manner when they hear something, and they pinpoint or triangulate that sound. And they can fly down and catch something like a mouse going by sound alone, sometimes without ever seeing it in the dark. And being that they're so good at rodent control, you know, farmers, people who have gardens, agricultural areas, orchards, whatever, can put up artificial nest boxes and track barn owls, and then nature is working for them. They're controlling the rodents. They don't have to use poisons and pesticides that pollute the food chain. A couple of years ago, I went out to Northern California and was driving up through wine country, and every single vineyard had like a dozen barn owl nest boxes on the property. There were barn owls everywhere. Thousands of mice they catch every year. So here we have a spectacled owl. And I'll stand back just a little bit farther away from you than I would with some of the other birds because she tends to be a little bit more nervous than the others. And this bird gets the name Spectacled Owl because of the unusual looking face. If she looks at you, she has that rounded face. There we go. That's one thing I can't train them not to do. That could happen at any moment. When the bird looks at you, she's got that rounded face that all the owls have. But in her case, the feathers around her eyes, she's got a dark mask of feathers with a border of lighter feathers around the edges. So basically it just looks like from off in the distance, she's wearing a big pair of goggles or glasses. So that's where the name Spectacled Owl comes from. And she's a much larger, much more powerful bird than a barn owl. Even though she's only a couple inches higher, she's much more muscular, much heavier, much bigger feet, able to catch larger prey. 
And you can hear her make, you might be able to hear her making some unusual chucking, chuckling sounds as I walk around. You know, we're taught, we've grown up knowing that owls make a hooting sound, but they do have quite a vocabulary. They can make quite a variety of sounds when they want to. They can screech and scream and whistle and bark like a dog and laugh like a person out there. You ever hear strange sounds coming out of the forest at night? You'd be surprised at how many of those sounds are made by owls. They can be really vocal, really noisy at certain times of year. Often during the summer when it's breeding season or when they have young flying around out there, they'll be talking to one another quite loudly. of feathers or horns that the little screech owl had. And great is in large in size because it is one of our larger owls. And they can typically catch things up to the size of squirrels and rabbits. They catch odd things sometimes. Great horned owls are known for occasionally catching skunks. You know, skunks are a tough customer and obviously they have that smell we're familiar with. That's actually been that's a problem for a great horned owl because if they get sprayed before they catch it, it can actually blind them because that spray is so powerful. Rehabbers get them every year brought to them that have been sprayed by skunks. But the going on instinct of flying around out there trying to survive, they see that thing moving around in the bushes. They don't think that it smells bad, they think it's cool. And owls don't fly very fast. They tend to fly very slow and often very low to the ground because if you think about it, they're flying around out there in low light or no light at all and they're trying to catch prey on the ground so it would make no sense for them to fly really high in the sky. Even if an owl is out during the day, you're never going to see one soaring high above the earth like you might a hawk or a falcon or an eagle. It serves no purpose. The closer they are to the ground, the more likely they are to be able to see in low light and hear the tiny sounds they need to be able to drop on that prey. That's why they're often seen hunting on a fence post right on the side of the road, maybe right in your yard, three feet off the ground. It's a just as effective a hunting perch for them as a high tree is for a hawk. And they can maneuver like a helicopter. One of the things that always fascinated me about all the birds is the way that they perform, how differently they can fly. They can't all do the same thing. They're designed for doing different things in different areas. Owls fly slow and low to the ground and very silently very, very soft feathers for the element of surprise, but they can maneuver really well from side to side, like a helicopter drops straight down onto the ground, flies straight up onto the ground. They can do things a hawk or a falcon cannot do. Okay, last owl coming up. Last owl is actually the largest species in the world, and it's a close cousin to the great horned owl. When you see it, you'll see some similarities. The one big difference is the color of the eye. Great horned owls always have a yellow eye, the iris, the colorful part. But our next owl has an orange eye. We're going to get him out here in a moment. And we're going to see if we can get our last owl to fly out and join us on the drone. What I'm going to do is open his box and we'll see if we can get him to come on out here on his own. 
I'll give him a little encouragement using this noisemaker called a clicker. You can find these in a pet store. Maybe even use one to train your dog or a cat at home. Sound. So basically, I've taught this particular owl from the time he was young. I got him when he was a baby from a breeder. He was only about 10 days old, a little ball of fluff. So from the moment I fed him a bite of food, I clicked the clicker. Throughout his life, he's always heard this when he's gotten a meal. So no matter where we are or what we're doing, he knows that this sound means food. And when you think about it, that's natural behavior because he's attracted to it the same way a wild owl would be to the little sounds coming off the ground at night. <laughs> I don't mind him following me around, but I don't encourage him and give him a bite of food when he does it unless I've actually called him. And that's really for his own good. Because he'll start to remember that. And at home, they live in aviaries in my backyard. And he's free inside the aviary. Now, if you, that's, his way of, that's his way of begging for a treat. So, let's say, for example, he's in his aviary and I'm out there mowing the lawn or doing some kind of a chore and he decides he's hungry and he wants to fly to me for food, he's going to be banging around inside that aviary and breaking feathers and so forth. So I never encourage it unless I actually give him a signal by holding up the glove. So I'll dig around in my bag. Got some little pieces of chicken in here. I'll give him a little piece. And... That beak, you know, whatever you want to learn what a bird eats. Study the, study the tool. That sharp hook beak designed to tear me out a pair of scissors. Very sharp on the edges, pointing at the tip. And he's eating a little piece of chicken right now. He gets a variety. They all get a variety of food. I try to keep the diet as natural as possible. Whole foods. They need whole animals, even if it's small. I can give him a little piece of chicken, but I can't go to the store and buy a piece of steak or chicken to feed the bird on a daily basis. It's not nutritionally complete. It's not a balanced diet. It doesn't have everything he needs in there. If he were to catch something large, like a squirrel or a rabbit, he'd eat all he could, continue to return to it until it was gone. If it was something small, like a mouse, he'd swallow it whole. Now he's getting something from every part of that meal. There's nothing there, buddy. So let's say he swallows a mouse. He's going to digest what he can. He's going to get protein from the meat, calcium from the bones, Vitamins and minerals from all the internal organs, and even the fur of that mouse serves a purpose. He's going to digest everything he can. Whatever he can't digest, like the bone in the fur, becomes a pellet. A little ball in their stomach, and they'll actually cough that up the following day after a large meal. It's kind of like having fiber in your diet. It cleans them out. They're very efficient in what they do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More, more, more. And that noise that he's making, that's not a hoop. That's a baby sound. That means feed me. Now... <coughs> He was born in 04, so obviously he's not a baby. Well, why is he making a baby noise? Because mentally, he's still a little bit of a baby in some ways. Basically, that's the sound that a young owl would make to its parents from the nest. Even when it's flying around on its own and learning how to hunt, it would be begging from its parents using that particular noise. Now, a wild owl is going to stop making that noise after a while. It wouldn't serve any purpose. They'd be independent. They'd be feeding themselves. But here it's different because his meals always come from me. He thinks he has to remind me. He thinks he has to tell me constantly. He does it with no effort whatsoever. Literally, the only time that bird stops making that noise is when he's completely stuffed with food or he's asleep. Sounds cute to you guys, but you know guys don't have to hear it two hours on the way home to New York. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Why did you buy a movie? I got trained on the
so to finish up this little lesson, something that he'll remember, rather than a couple of little pieces, I'm going to give him a nice big mouse. Remember what I said about them eating mice and swallowing mice whole. So in my glove, I have a mouse. And I will hold it up, and you'll see him make it disappear like a magic trick. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think he is into his mouth all the way in there? Stop making! <laughs> He'll keep right on eating. <laughs> I monitor all their diet and their weight very carefully. Getting overweight is an unnatural state for a bird. Getting underweight is obviously an unnatural state. I want them to be in a fit, healthy, athletic state. So I weigh them on an electronic scale that tells me right down to the last gram what they weigh, and I feed them accordingly. <laughs> when he was a young, growing bird, he would eat 15 to 20 of those a day. <laughs> One more for the road. <laughs> That's oh another thing I try not to let him do. Take the food to the ground. Bad habit. <laughs> no, he's not eating it because he's staring at it. down. Sometimes when he gets really good and I can't outrun him anymore, when he swoops down to catch it, I'll pull it away, hide it in my bag, make him chase it over and over again until he's exhausted. Because I know all that exercise is going to pay off. He's building muscle. Then he gets a big meal. Just like an athlete. You know, if you play sports, there are certain things you do if you want to improve. Work out. Get good exercise. Eat good food. Get good rest. If I want the birds to be the best, I have to give them all those same things on a daily basis. Or as often as possible. So we're going to give it a try with a Harris Hawk. I need somebody to help me out. I need an assistant for this part of the program. No, no, not yet. Not yet. Follow some very simple instructions. Okay, I do this every day. And my left knee is not really fond of it anymore. So I recruited a rabbit out of the audience. So here's what we're going to do. See, that's a lesson in life. Don't volunteer unless you know what you're volunteering for. You know what I mean? Now, this is a simple exercise. Here's what we're going to do. I'm going to give him some instructions. I'm going to hide the lure where the bird can't see it. Create the element of surprise. If I'm walking around out there in the woods and I'm hunting for real and he's up above in that tree, we never know when a rabbit can take off out from the bush. He may only have a second to catch it before it disappears. I want to teach him to be paying attention, to go for it as soon as he sees it. So I'm going to hide the lure somewhere where the bird can't see. It doesn't really matter where. He's going to be in charge of the lure. I'm going to take out the hawk, release the hawk. He'll go up and pick a spot in the tree somewhere, and I'll give him a second. And then, maybe I'll take a little walk around, I'll shout a command to the bird, try to get him to follow me and move up a time or two. It depends on how he's behaving. He's a young bird. He's only in his second year. So he's still kind of learning all the lessons I'm trying to teach him. He makes a lot of silly mistakes. Landing in wrong trees, wrong branches and so forth, fumbling around in the trees. He's a little uncoordinated. But he's learning. And learning only comes through repetition and practice, so that's why we're here. So. When the time is right, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give him a silent signal. Actually, all of us, a silent signal. Raising my right hand over my head. Now, when he sees that, he's going to, we're going to try to find a place for him to run. Maybe down the edge of the field or maybe over in that direction. Doesn't really matter where. And we'll see how fast he can run. <laughs> now, there's an important part to this. The commands that the bird knows. He knows two simple commands. See, that's him banging around the box. He knows what we're up to. So one command that I'll yell is, up, it means move up, follow. But the most important command of all, by far, is the bird's name. Now, I don't use his name the way we do socially. You know, if I called the bird's name whenever I wanted to get his attention at home, he'd get sick of hearing it. It wouldn't mean anything to him anymore. He would ignore it. The reason it's effective 
And the reason he responds to it is I only use his name when it's time to catch the lure. Or a real rabbit if we're hunting for real, never at any other time. So no matter where we are or what's going on or what noise or distractions are out there, when he hears that name shouted, he's focused on one thing and one thing only, the running rabbit on the ground. Where is it? How do I catch it? So I'm going to tell you his name. And then when I raise my hand, and only when I raise my hand, I want everybody to shout his name one time at exactly the same moment as loudly as you can. And be loud. The louder you are, the more excited the bird gets. Okay? His name is Razor. Everybody got that? Razor. Okay. So, rabbit. Over here. Rabbit. Oh my god, he's scared. We also gotta find the sock for you Abbott is understandably nervous. <laughs> I think he'll be fine. Uh, we're going to make this quick. Oh, that's He's eager to go. But I don't want him to go until I release yeah, him again. Yeah. Otherwise, I'm teaching him just to keep on lunging off of the hand like that. That's why the chests are so handy, because I can hold on to the chest. And you notice a bell ringing. Some of the other equipment that we use, the bell is important. When that bird, you can see how he blends in. Look, he already disappeared. If you didn't know he was there, you could be out here all day long and not know that bird was sitting right in that tree. But that bell will tell me if he's moving around in the forest. It'll tell me if he's chasing something, if he's going to the ground, if he's going in another direction. So I'm just letting him have a little look around. Also, he's right above the rabbit. That'd be a little bit of an easy shot. I'd like to get the bird down here, so I'm going to see if I can move him down in this direction. But he's no dummy. He knows what we're up to. He knows one of us is the rabbit. He just doesn't know which one. <laughs> hop, hop. Hop, hop. Hop, hop. Oh, I see him. Oh. He's a quick mother. Oh no, he's running over there. He's over there. Oh, I kids over there. Yeah, the kids over there. Oh, oh, oh. 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 something. He wasn't just casually flying over the field. So I looked down and there goes the rabbit running <laughs> So hey, you know what? I put a positive spin on it because even though that's not the way it normally works, it's another lesson for this bird. It's not always going to work the way you're expecting it to work. He took off, the rabbit took off, even without hearing his name, without me raising my hand, any of that stuff, he still went after it and caught it. So. It's all a good lesson at the end of the day, as long as it ends well. That kind of training, and I'm going to take the bird out and go hunting for real. Uh, that takes place in the late fall and through the winter in the regular hunting season for small game and so forth. And obviously all of this is controlled by state laws and so forth. But one of the things I stress about it is teamwork. It may sound a little strange because the bird is catching the prey, but a lot of it has to do with me as kind of the coach of the team. 
You know, we both have a job to do. Bird's job is to catch that rabbit. My, my job is to help him find one. Take him to a place where one might be so he can be successful. But also help him actually find one in the field. Because his eyesight is far better than ours. But they don't see things the same way we do. And they certainly don't think about things the way we do. One of the things about him is he's going to be more likely to react to movement. If he flies over a field or out through the forest and there's a rabbit or a squirrel that sees that shadow pass overhead, if it freezes and holds perfectly still, he's likely to fly right by and never see it. My job is to work for the bird on the ground by chasing that prey out of hiding. Whatever it might be, make it move so he can see it, and that's one of the main reasons he follows me. He knows I'm doing that for him on the ground. Now, that can be a difficult job, so I have some partners who help me do that job. They work for the bird as well, and I want to bring them out here and introduce them to you just to show you how two very different types of animal can be trained to work together for a common goal. They are coming here. No. No? So, these are the most important members of the team. Hey, you come here. <laughs> hey, the Fork at me non stop. He doesn't want me to stand here talking, he wants to go hunting. And that's why the two of them automatically head over to the perimeter where something might be hanging out. They might find a squirrel or a rabbit. They know that's where they tend to be hanging out. Bell and Pop! Come on, Bell and Pop! Come on, Bell! So, who's got a dog at home? Raise your hand. Okay, of course. Now, we all know dogs make wonderful pets and companions. They're very social, intelligent creatures, very loving in nature and so forth. But what a lot of people, I think, don't know is that, you know, first of all, it's amazing yeah. how many different breeds of dog there are all around the world. If you watch a dog show on TV, it's crazy how many different types there are. And a lot of the dogs you see, although they've been around for a long time throughout history, a lot of them were bred originally not to be pets, but to be working dogs. And we've got all kinds of working dogs today that do all kinds of unusual jobs. Seeing eye dogs for the blind, therapy dogs, dogs that work for the police and the military. Out west, farmers have very expensive cattle, horses, and cows that they have to protect from predators like wolves and bears. They've got cattle dogs to guide them and offer security. So it's amazing how many different things that they can do and do well. These little characters are hardworking hunting dogs. These are miniature dachshunds. They're a German breed, originally bred over 400 years ago to hunt game on and underground even. Their small bodies allow them to get into all those places and even go underground to chase out quarry. And they're in the hound family like a bloodhound, so they have an excellent nose for tracking and trailing scent. Their noses are so good, people have trained dachshunds to find lost hikers in a wilderness using scraps of clothing. These little dogs are trained to do one thing, and they love to do it above all else. To use that nose, you can see when they're moving around, they're almost always that nose is on the ground. They follow their nose. They are looking for the scent of a rabbit. So their job is to find and follow that scent to the rabbit, not to catch it, but to chase it out of hiding so that the bird can catch it. And the bird, studying from above, learns very quickly what the dogs are doing. And that bird will ignore me and follow the dogs through the forest from the tops of the trees, watching them, <laughs> waiting for the chance to catch that rabbit. So they're a very important part of the team. Aww, right? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Every winter for going on 15 years old, believe it or not. So. A couple, of them are, a couple of them are easing into retirement. Yeah. So there's a new generation coming. All right, come on, Belle. Come on. When she's good, I give her a little chicken treat because she knows what's in the bag when she's bad at <laughs> Belle, bang! <laughs> Belle, bang! <laughs> bang! She's <laughs> <laughs> bang. Okay, last bird to finish us up is going to be the falcon. Now, the falcon. The falcon is the really unusual one in the group in that falcons don't live in the forest, they don't catch rodents on the ground. Now, there's always exceptions. General rule, falcons are bird of the wide open spaces, they catch and eat other birds. Almost exclusively, they feed on other birds. So, my bird lure, that's where this comes in. This is the exercise lure for the falcon. Just a little piece of leather, doesn't look much like a bird, but that's okay, he doesn't care. 
He knows when he catches it, he gets his reward. So basically, I take him out into an open area. Now we look around, we say, oh cool, an open area, a field and so forth. For the Falcon, this is a very, very difficult place to fly because they fly at high speed in a straight line. They do not maneuver well. They cannot change direction like an owl or a hawk in the forest. So it's very awkward to come through here at high speed and be flying right at a wall of trees. Long pointed wings built for so speed, a short tail, so no maneuverability, no brakes, if you will. They hunt from high in the sky. Their favorite technique is to circle. They go thousands of feet in the air, disappear from sight. Believe it or not, there are falcons above us right now that we can't see. Peregrines and merlins that live in this area that live up north, they're migrating right now, headed all, all headed south. Migration is speeding up right now. So, they're flying up there where they can't be seen. Now a bird who doesn't know any better flies out over the top of the trees. It doesn't know that that falcon waits high above. That falcon with that eyesight can see for miles below in all directions. And they simply pick out that moving target, fold their wings tight to their body and come down in a high speed dive to catch that bird out of the air. Now they've done experiments with peregrines, which are the most famous falcons and the fastest falcons, and they've clocked them on radar at speeds of well over 200 miles an hour in a dive. Everything about the falcon is built for speed. They tend to be small and compact. So basically what I do, take him out into a field, release him, he begins to circle me and wait for me to pull the lure out. I pull the lure out. I begin swinging it around and around. I keep it in the air, a moving target for him to chase. Now he comes at me as fast as he can and tries to take the lure away. But I don't let him catch it. I play a little game of keep away. As the bird gets close to me, I throw the lure out. Let's say you're the falcon, okay? I throw the lure out. I get it as close to the falcon as I possibly can without actually letting him catch it. So I throw it out, and then I pull it away. And he flies by me, makes a big turn, comes back, and again, when he gets close, I throw the lure out, and I pull it away. And sometimes I can hide it behind my back. He'll pause right above me, he'll fold into a dive, I can throw it up and pull it away. All the while, he's getting exercise. It's an aerobic workout, like a runner who does laps, he's doing his laps in the sky. When the time is right, I allow him to catch the lure, take it to the ground, he earns his meal. So just another game, try to keep it as natural as possible, let the falcon do what he does best. Here, it's gonna be difficult. I can tell you what's gonna happen. I'm gonna put him down and I'm gonna pull him off with lure. He's gonna take off and find some place of perch, a nice clean perch like the peak of that roof right there. He'll end up up there. When he comes flying through here, he's gonna have a decision to make at the last second about going into the trees, either landing in a tree awkwardly or continuing through. So it's gonna be challenging. And I'm gonna lose sight of him. We probably all will if he comes around behind those trees. We'll lose sight of him and I'll just keep swinging the lure and start to come on in. And We'll try to give him the lure on cue. This time, we're going to try to do it properly with good timing. <laughs> so what will happen is, I'll tell you his name, and I'll count to three. And when I get to three, everybody shout his name. We'll let him catch the lure. So on three, his name is Daredevil. He's a jur falcon, by the way, a small male jur falcon. It's an arctic species. I would try. I would try. You'll see the color of the bird. If I didn't tell you what it was, it would be a pretty good clue as to where they live in the wild, in the tundra. All around the world in Arctic habitat. Canada, Alaska, and so forth. Occasionally, when winters are extreme, and prey gets harder to find up north, they will show up down here along the coast, just like snowy owls. Sure, falcon, daytime version of a snowy owl, an Arctic predator. And they can't catch that food. They've got to come south until they find a spot where the hunting is a little easier. All right, this guy's ready to go too. His hood, made out of leather, fits him perfectly and comfortably, like custom-made hat. Pull the hood because it blocks his vision. From time to time when traveling and whatnot, some of the birds wear hoods. If you see something that frightens him, that can be a negative experience. If one of you frightened him, I couldn't explain to the bird that there was nothing to fear, that you meant no harm. What I could do is put the hood on his head. Out of sight, out of mind. Remember, a visually oriented creature. Take that sight away, take away that fear immediately. One time, one time I 
doing he's the show like this. You see how he's looking around? Looking around in between the boxes. One time, I forgot the rabbit ear in between the boxes. And he said, that ain't a bird lure, but it's a lure. He went down between the boxes. He had it. It was like the greatest thing he had ever done. He had that rabbit ear. He was so proud of himself. Now, every time he comes out, he's looking to keep going around. <laughs> but I thought of it today, and I put it inside one of the Like he said that he was gonna do. Yeah, I know. It's like his favorite spot. Move around any tree branches or any of that. Just go right up there. Mama, you have to say it. <laughs> We've flown him in the past sometimes down in the big field down on the other side of the hill. But even that is a little bit of a valley. And as he comes racing down through there, he's got to negotiate a turn and avoid all the trees and all that. So ideally, I try to take him out to a place like a football field to really allow him the room he needs. Otherwise, he gets a little frustrated because in a smaller area, you know, it's a lot easier just to stop and land on a perch than it is to try to avoid things and change direction at high speed at the last yeah. possible second. <laughs> <laughs> See that time he tried to land in a tree at the last second, but it was a little he was going a little too fast, he couldn't slow down, he couldn't get a good grip, so he struggled his way through the tree and continued on. Pretty much as we predicted. Now he's way over there. And I don't know that he can see me. Now, birds of prey don't think the way we do. He's not necessarily going to say, oh, let me go look for him. He's over there somewhere. They don't think that way. <laughs> he's not going to do anything until he sees the lure again. They don't have a homing instinct. He's not going to come looking for me. I have to go looking for him. And all I'm really going to do is stay in motion and change the angle. Because at some point, he's going to be able to see me. He's going to do a little back and see me. And there's a little tiny hole that I can see him and he can probably see me. Ha ha! Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Hey, the biggest danger, the biggest danger for a bird like this is not a car, it's a wild hawk. Because he's paying attention to me, he's paying attention to the lure, he is focused on that. That leaves blind spots. He's not necessarily checking all around suspiciously. A bird like a hungry young red-tailed hawk, he's been chased by wild hawks so many times. Give me a heart attack. Luckily, he's gotten really good at avoiding them, but all it takes is once. I'm not sure where he landed that time. On the roof, yeah. On this one, we'll call him off and let him catch the lure. So you guys know his name? Air Devil. On the three. You guys see him first. On the chimney. On the chimney, okay, good enough. Okay, so everybody, back it up over here. Because when he comes through, he's going to catch the lure, and I don't want him crashing into somebody at 80 miles an hour. <laughs> okay, let's just try a blind call. He can't see me, I can't see him. I know he's on a chimney, but I can't see him. So, on three. Be loud. One, two, three. Yeah!
and wouldn't mind donating. I always appreciate getting those little mementos. Something for the website when I catch up with the modern world and put one up. So if you don't mind, I'm gonna put some cards right here. Just take one, email me, whatever you choose to donate. It's well appreciated. Thank you very much. Thank you. You're welcome. May I have one, please? 